Welcome to Road Testament. This week I sat down with RAF pilot and fastest man in the world on land, Andy Green. His resume should be self-evident, but if it isn't, in 1997, Andy hit 763 miles per hour in the twin jet powered thrust SSC, breaking the sound barrier and setting the world land speed record. That record still stands, but next year he'll pilot the jet and hybrid rocket powered Bloodhound SSC when it makes a run at 800 miles per hour. The main event will happen a year later in 2014, when Bloodhound will shoot for 1,000 miles per hour. Andy is an absolute legend, a decent radical racer, as Chris Harris recently found out, and a font of knowledge about the physics of going really, really fast. That's Andy Green, today on Road Testament. So Andy Green, very good to see you, as always. Mike, good to see you again. Yeah, yeah. So um, we're at the LA Auto Show. Uh, yep. why, why are you in LA and what's, what's happening? Why are we at the Bentley stand? I got a great call from Bentley a couple of months ago. They're making a, uh, a series um, called the, the, the Mulsanne Visionary Series, where they, they get key characters like uh, Jean Todd of the FIA talking about the future of uh, the automobile, and Wang Shu, the architect, talking about the future of cities. And they gave me a call and said, do you want to make a video about the future of speed? Well, I can make something up. <laughs> I think you're qualified but, to uh, speak on the future. But the, but the deal, of course, was that we would take uh, the, the, the flagship of, uh, of their series, the, uh, the Bentley Mulsanne, out to Bonneville, which is, is always a beautiful place to visit, uh, drive it flat out and make the world's fastest documentary. So it was, it was great fun to make this little film. Um, and uh, I came here to, uh, to L.A., to launch that film last night. So uh, that's out on the web now, and, uh, and it's, it's a beautiful piece of footage. If you want to know what Bonneville looks like and why I love going there, they captured it really nicely. Yeah, so now, how, what's the fast, you, you did this in a Bentley, a sort of a stock Bentley in Mulsanne, right? Quite literally, they took a new Bentley, they drove it to, uh, to Bonneville Salt Flats, they took 10, put 10 pounds of air in the tires, and then we got into uh, to the car with a camera crew and took it up to 191 miles an hour and just sat there filming. It was the most amazing experience. Now, I'm assuming that it's not the fastest you've driven on Bonneville, or? Um... No, I've been lucky enough. I've, uh, I've been up to 350 in the world's fastest diesel car, the, uh, the JCB oh, yes. diesel car, six years ago. So I actually had to earn my 300 mile an hour cap, <laughs> which was great. Right. So they take, take me a bit more seriously now. So they give you, a, did they give you a, uh, something like a lapel pin or something to wear when you get to the 300 mile an hour club? Or yeah, the, uh, the, the, the entry level for the club's 200 mile an hour club. Anybody you see wearing a red baseball cap with a, with a sort of blue sticker, that's, they've done, they've set a record at 200. Now there's actually, there's about three times as many people have climbed to the top of Everest than have actually set a 200 mile an hour record. So this wow. is quite a small club. Yeah. You go to the 300 mile an hour club, you're now down to about 70 odd people. So there's more people been in space than have actually got 300 mile an hour caps. So I'm actually, I'm quite proud of that. It's, uh, it, 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 was, it was a great opportunity. And, and of course, Bonneville, you know, the US pretty much defined the whole hot rodding and, uh, and straight line racing scene over the last 50 years. And Bonneville is the home. It's where all the great land speed record breakers over the last 50 years went to run cars and to become the fastest man on earth. So it's, it's a very special place. Well, speaking of the fastest man on earth, um, you, let's see, it was 1997. Yes, well, sir. Let's go back to uh, the, the Thrust SSC. Um, 763 miles an hour at that time, which was uh, breaking the speed, the, the breaking the sound barrier for the first yep. time. So now the Bloodhound SSC, you guys are pushing to a thousand. So it seems that land speed records go about increase by about 200, 100 to 200 miles per hour every 20 years or so. Yeah. Is that, I mean, roughly, I mean, since... Every, every, every 10 or 15 years, a crazy bunch of people come along and go, right, let's try this. Right. And, and it happens in groups. You know, in the 1960s, there were a huge number of people. That, you know, there were the great American racers. There was uh, Art Arfons and Craig Breedlove and, right. you know, 1970, Gary Gablech, all setting this amazing cluster of records. Yeah. Then nothing happened for 15 years. Right. Then Richard Noble came along, but, but sort of as an isolated. And then another 15 years later, we finish up with us and Craig Breedlove now racing for 700 miles an hour, racing for the sound barrier. Um, forward again, another 15 years. Now we've got half a dozen teams around the world all engaged in trying to break that 15 year old record and some of them trying to push a thousand miles an hour. So we've got a couple of American teams, um, one of which the North American Eagle was running last month. Yeah. They got up to about 400 miles an hour and 
like all land speed records, got rained off. That happens. It's that happens to all of us. Yeah. Um, other end of the you know, other side of the planet, we've got the Australians. Roscoe McGlashan is building a, uh, a rocket car, and he's he's mostly finished his rocket car. So we're dying to see if he can get that running next yeah. year. And our entry, Bloodhound supersonic car, targeting a thousand miles an hour. And of course, the traditional reason for doing this is, well, we, you know, we'll go and defend our record against the competition. Right. It's very, you know, money's very tight right now. Um, the environment becomes progressively more important, sustainability, clean energy. You know, can we justify ever bigger, more fuel-hungry land speed record cars? You know, that's quite a tough sell. Right. We've got a slightly bigger aim, and all, and all the teams um, have got the same aim, of trying to make science and technology just more fun and more exciting for the average 8, 10, 12 year old kid, boy or girl. You know, to replace the posters of the 1960s, you know, Saturn V rockets, and the 1980s with Lamborghinis and Corvettes, um, or you know, the modern Formula One and NASCAR. And ac actually, none of those people, particularly the racers, they have to keep all their technology secret. Because if you've got a little edge, something that works that nobody else has got, that's your racing edge. And you've got to keep it secret. You can't tell anybody, that's why you win. Sure. So, so that's your special secret. We're the only people with a Bloodhound supersonic car. So our secrets about making that particular car work aren't actually secret. So we can share the whole thing. We can get kids excited about a car that will go from a standing start to being 12 miles away in two minutes. And we can tell them everything, that, how we're gonna do it, why we're doing it, and then actually share it with them as we do it. Yeah. You know, even to the point of running, streaming live video from the car at a thousand miles an hour. I mean, that's, that's really cool. I think, you know, with the internet and with um, that you can open the project up and tech, you just sort of show the technology and as you were saying get, yeah. getting kids interested in it um, what are though what are the the latest hurdles right because when you go from 400 to 600 you know you have certain certain uh, technological breakthroughs you need to make before you get there from six to seven to seven to eight now we're getting into you know four digits what exists now technologically that didn't exist in 1997 when you did okay. uh, Yeah, great question. Um, where, where are the jumps in speed? You've got to have a lot of power. You've got to be able to control it. You've got to have somewhere to run it. Um, power, we've, we've got a lot of power plants in this car. We've got a, a state-of-the-art jet engine, the, uh, the Eurofighter uh, jet engine. You know, it's, it's one of the best jet engines in the world. Uh, you'd never get one of those from the production line. But the test program finished a few years ago, so all those test engines are now basically they've got a few hours left on them. They're museum pieces. So this is this is high tech recycling. We're just okay. borrowing those yeah, for a little sure. bit to uh, to run them. So that gives us about nine tons of thrust okay. for a car like this. That's about sixty thousand horsepower. That's a good start. Yeah. That'll get us up to maybe seven hundred. So we okay. need more power than that if we're going to go faster. So we're building our own hybrid rocket, same sort of technology that uh, the Virgin Galactic uh, uh, oh, sure. space plane yeah. being developed in Mojave is using. Solid rubber fuel pumping liquid oxidizer in four gallons a second at a thousand pounds per square inch. So the pump, the, the problem is pumping that in at really high pressure. Right. That rocket will give us 12 tons of thrust. That's another 75,000 uh, horsepower. So you're getting there. So you're, so you're up to 135,000 now. That's enough to get to a thousand miles an hour. But to pump, the, the rocket pump takes 800 horsepower just to turn it. So we need another engine, which is the pump motor which is made by Cosworth, and it's a Cosworth Formula One engine. Oh, wow. V8, 800 horsepower engine, just to turn the pump motor. All of that in a package that's small enough and thin enough will get us to 1,000 miles an hour. OK, so that's the power element. Right. Now, so if I'm not mistaken, that's, I mean, just looking at 135,000 yeah. uh, miles per hour. 1,000 horsepower, 000 yeah. horsepower is a, the Formula One grid times six, is that? Um, uh, yeah. Something like that's, that. That's, in, in fact, I think it's, depending on how many cars on you, you're somewhere between six and eight times the whole of a Formula One grid. It's, uh, it's a big number. It's a big number. Um, the, uh, the, having got the power, you need to control it. So the single biggest change in technology um, is the, the aerodynamics. 15 years ago, we were right on the limit of what computers could model and what aerodynamic modeling. And the car was just about good enough, but really wasn't going to go much faster. We were at the limit of what we could do at the time. 15 years later, and you know, go, let's go back 15 years. Um, it's, it's astonishing to believe broadband didn't exist. Most people didn't have access to the internet. You know, it's, it was the dark ages in terms of technology. Nowadays, what was a supercomputer then is now just a medium-sized desktop. 
So technology has just leapt forwards. We can model so much more. So the whole aerodynamic modelling, understanding what's going on, we are so much better placed. So we've got a really, really good, and it, and it still took us five years to find a solution that would keep this car on the ground from 200 miles an hour all the way up to 1.4 times the speed of sound, 1,000 miles an hour. So we've, we've cracked that bit. So we've got the control. Third thing, uh, and, and of course you need the structure to support it. That, that's just good engineering, so just, you know, just high technology. The third thing you need is somewhere to run it. And we looked at uh, Bonneville Salt Flats, too short and a bit soft at the ends. We looked at where we ran last time, which was uh, in Nevada, the Black Rock Desert. Right. It's been very rough and bumpy and, uh, and soft over the last few years. But, you know, they've had a lot of weather problems, they've had surface problems, so we had to find somewhere else. And we managed to find a surface, uh, another dry lake bed out in South Africa, just long enough, 12 miles. It had 6,000 tonnes of stones on the surface. Well, I mean, now, huge quantity. Was, did you guys really find it by looking on Google Earth? Was that kind of a, or was that just, you, you knew uh, where basically to look, or was it a, was that it was, a... It was a bit more sophisticated okay, than that. So. Um, I actually spent uh, a year with a university uh, developing uh, some programmes using uh, radar maps from the space shuttle and some, some of the environmental maps from uh, uh, the satellite called uh, Landsat which takes, uh, you know, takes environmental uh, pictures. And, and you, can, you can process that to show where there's vegetation and where there's water, which means you can invert that picture and find out where there's no vegetation and no water. And your radar map will show you where it's flat. And if you've got flat, no vegetation, no water, if you go through Google Earth and look at every single place that qualifies as being flat with nothing on it, one of them's gonna be a desert. And we, and we found about 30 or 40 deserts, and then I spent my, my summer holiday for two years was going to visit all these places. And I, I went all over the, uh, the US looking at Bonneville and Black Rock and, and a bunch of other places nobody's run. Yeah. I went to, I looked at some places in South America, there's one in Turkey, there's three or four in Australia, and one or two in South Africa. And the, the best by far was the one in South Africa. It's got a much longer weather window, it's actually a better surface underneath. The problem was all these stones. And bless them, the, the, the local government, the Northern Cape government, which is right in the north of South Africa, they just said, all right, We'll help you clear this. You know, we, we get the value for the country. And they employed 300 people from the local townships. And this, this is a really poor area. So actually, it was really valuable for them to actually uh, you know, start to be able to earn some money sure. investing in their future. These guys, 300 of them, cleared uh, around about 200 million square feet of how, surface. How do, how do they, I mean, do they literally walk the course yeah. and uh, find the rocks? And line abreast with shovels and, and pry bars picking these stones, because they're all set into the surface. They're picking these stones out, putting them in little piles. Another bunch of guys with wheelbarrows come in, put them in barrows, put them in trucks. 6,000 tons of stones. That's about 20 tons per person. So, you know, these guys, you know, they're my heroes. The, the amount of effort they put into this, and the, the surface they've left, I was out there a few months ago having a look at it. They're just finishing off the work, and it is quite literally the best racetrack I have ever seen for a land speed record. Now, what, what is the surface? Is it a packed powder? Is it yes, it's, it's, it's a very, very hard mud surface. If you, if you imagine in drought conditions when you know, a reservoir dries out and you finish up with that very hard, uh, yes, uh, crack, solid crack mud layer with, with the cracks in it, yeah, yeah. that really solid mud, that's exactly what we're looking for. But of course, it doesn't dry sort of reservoir shape. This is a dry lake bed, so it's 12 miles and perfectly flat. It's just what we need. So, um, the thing that I learned from 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 thrust uh, from you know all those years ago is that breaking the sound barrier on land is very different from breaking the sound barrier when you're up in the air. Yeah. Now, as a pilot, you've done that in the air a few Many times. times right? <laughs> yeah. When you do it on the ground. Lots of other things come into play, right? So you have a, a, a shock wave. I mean, tell me a little bit about how that shock wave happens and what, what are the, the perils of breaking the sound barrier with the ground under you? So. It, yeah, quite simply, we understand the flow over the top of the car. You know, people have been doing that for 65 years since Chuck Yeager first, uh, first cracked it in the, uh, in the X1. It's the flow underneath the car and managing that pressure change and the flow around the back end because aeroplane, you know, aeroplanes don't have wheels and, uh, and suspension sticking out at the back end. The flow around there is really complicated. That, it took us a year and a half to, to work out how we were going to manage that. And that was, the, that was the last big problem. Having got all of that, um, it, it is, it's just, it's a very sophisticated, iterative design to work out how we're going to manage the flow so that the car never generates any lift, never generates any downfall, so it just runs neutral the whole time. The problem, of course, is that the, the airflow underneath, because we're running in very thick air, you know, 
1,000 miles an hour at ground level, no jet fighter in the world will do 1,000 miles an hour. The air is too thick. They have to go up to 30, 40,000 feet to go that fast. So we are going faster than any jet fighter has ever been at ground level through the thick air. It, the, the bow wave around the car, particularly around the wheels, the shock waves that the wheels form, will tear the surface up as they're running along it. So the wheels are actually running along this surface that they're tearing up. The front wheels then throw up all this dust and dirt, so the rest of the car is now running through this big thick fog of, uh, of mud and, uh, uh, and powder in the, uh, in the air. So it's an interesting challenge for a driver because at, at slow speed, of course, the wheels are gripping the surface, like, sort of like normal wheels, they're cutting into this, this hard mud surface. You start to go supersonic, the airflow, the, the, uh, the shock waves around the wheels start to rip the surface up. So it actually starts to break the surface up under the wheels, so the wheels are now sliding. And to give you some idea of the grip levels, tarmac's a grip level of about one. That's what you get on the road. When it's raining, it goes down to maybe about 0 0.5, 0 0.6, which is like the salt at Bonneville on a good day. Dry lake bed, you're about half of that. So you're down about 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and that's your starter. When you go supersonic, it goes down even lower. So the car is so loose, it is sliding all over the place. And I'm steering it now, not with the grip of the wheels, but actually the wheels stick into the airflow, and I'm now steering it with the aerodynamics. So it's, it's more starting to handle more like a jet fighter. Now that's, well, that's, luckily you have experience in that. That's I, I've practiced that as well. <laughs> Um, no, but that's amazing to me because um, it, it must take, it, it's about finesse at that level, right? I mean, you're, yeah. you're really just finessing the car and it looks, because it looks pin straight when, um, when it's going across the... Uh... But you go out and have a look at the tracks afterwards and you see the car wandering about and you see the tracks moving about. And of course, with, uh, with new technology, streaming live video from the cockpit, you're actually going to be seeing the, uh, the, the steering inputs. So actually, every time we run, we're going to have about 10 or 20 million people marking my homework. I'll be far too busy to worry about it though. <laughs> so do you, I mean, are, is it literally full oppo or do you... Uh, do you Hopefully not that much, but it's, okay. it's whatever it takes. It's like any race car. If it gets loose and starts to get sideways, you put in enough steering to correct it, yeah. whatever that is at the time. And of course, as the aerodynamic changes, the amount of steering will change with speed for, the, uh, for an angle off. So that's the interesting bit. And of course, back, back to our main aim, our legacy of the education program of getting kids involved, of showing off explaining how technology works and making it exciting. Being able to explain it beforehand on the, uh, on the website, Bloodhound SSC website, being able to show them live with the video, and at the same time we're downloading live data, so they can actually download the data and actually have a look at the balance of the car, they can have a look at the aerodynamic, they can do their own science lessons around this car real time while we're running, which is it's never been done before. We're really excited about yeah, that. That's fantastic. So where are you in the process and um, what do you have uh, what you left to do to get it? We've got the first major chunk of chassis was delivered last week. Okay. We've got the money in the bank to finish the car. The cockpit, and the monocoque, the carbon fibre is all in the moulds right now. So by early next year we are assembling the, uh, uh, the chassis, putting it on its wheels. By the middle of next year we'll be ready to test it. And by the end of 2013 we're out in South Africa pushing up to 800 miles an hour, getting ready for the big record, 2014, 1,000 miles an hour. Fantastic. So 800 will be a record and then the next year an even bigger record, an even bigger record. And, and, and a bigger engineering adventure for a whole generation of young scientists. Exactly. Andy Green, always a pleasure. Great Mike, to see you. good to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. Talk to you soon. And uh, we'll see you in uh, South Africa in a couple of years. Looking forward to it.